The quantum systems that we have described so far are well isolated, in particular do not exchange any energy with the environment. The Hamiltonian is then made out of the internal energies of the system, as well as external potential energies that are independent of time. On the classical level, this corresponds to the conditions for a system with a conserved total energy. The quantum system is then described by a time-independent Hamiltonian, resulting in particular in the dynamics that we described in the last chapter. We call such systems autonomous closed systems. These two qualifiers, autonomous and closed, indicate that we can depart from these conditions in two ways. In the present chapter, we admit the external potential energies to be time-dependent, resulting in a non-autonomous driven system. As we will see, this modifies the nature of the dynamics of the system in a very specific way. For instance, the energy isn't conserved anymore, but the dynamics remains described by a unitary time evolution operator. What is important for this setting is that the external potential energies are still prescribed, so there is no noticeable influence of the quantum system on the physical entities that generate the corresponding fields, which are essentially classical. Once the interaction with the environment becomes dynamical, we obtain an open system. This makes the quantum system part of a larger system, which is the setting that we address in the next chapter. So the goal for this chapter is then to consider the time-dependent Schrödinger equation for situations where the Hamiltonian itself is a function of time. The plan for the present chapter comprises two general discussions, which are sandwiched between three illustrative examples. We start with the example of a harmonically driven spin. This is an exactly solvable system in which we can obtain precise expressions for the dynamics, according to which the spin performs so-called Rabi oscillations. Equipped with this working experience for the dynamics of one specific driven system, we then identify some very general aspects of such dynamics. This can be achieved by adapting the time evolution operator to this setting. We establish that it maintains many of its useful general features, even though determining this operator for specific systems can now be a bit more involved. And these general features are indeed all that we need to set up two frameworks that target the dynamics in a much more direct way. The first framework is based on the Ehrenfest theorem, which sets up equations of motion for expectation values. The second is the Heisenberg picture, which turns the operators of the observables themselves into time-dependent objects. Next, we illustrate these two frameworks for our second example, the driven harmonic oscillator. Then we come to the second general discussion, where we specifically target the way the driven quantum system changes its energy. For this, we take an autonomous system as a reference point, and then formulate a probability for the system to change from one of the reference states into another. This we call a transition. The transition rates can be conveniently evaluated in a perturbative approach. Indeed, the ubiquitous physical settings to which this applies share a number of features that simplify their perturbative description, resulting in a compact expression for the transition rate known as Fermi's Golden Rule. And with this, we then turn to our third example, namely the description of radiative transitions between atomic levels by the emission or absorption of a photon. As part of this discussion, we also explain the origin of so-called selection rules. And with the photon being really a quantum particle that carries its own energy and angular momentum, this then smoothly leads us on to the next chapter. So our first example concerns a two-level system, with the static energy associated with the Pauli Z matrix and a harmonically varying driving field involving the Pauli X and Y matrices. Let us concretely think of a spin. This would then be exposed to a static magnetic field component pointing in the Z direction, as well as a rotating magnetic component rotating in the XY plane, as you would obtain from circularly polarized light. The Hamiltonian then corresponds to the 2x2 two two matrix given here, where the off-diagonal terms combine into exponentials by the Euler rule. 
The relevant parameters are the energy level splitting delta in the static part, which we take as a reference system to compare our results with, as well as the driving amplitude v and the driving frequency little omega. These are all real parameters, as the Hamiltonian must be Hamiltonian for all times. Setting the driving amplitude to zero, we end up with a static system, for which the eigenstates are just the basis states, with the two energy levels arranged symmetrically around zero. Now we saw in the last chapter that the static dynamics of a quantum spin is very simple. With the additional driving it becomes slightly more involved, but by not too much. Indeed, we can still find an exact solution to this problem. This is best developed by starting from a trial solution, which is the expression given here. This searches for a certain initial condition encoded in the parameters a and b, for which the spin still performs a rotation about the z-axis, but now with a frequency little omega. We will indeed find two such solutions, with two values also of the frequency capital omega in here, and with this we can then write any solution as a superposition of these two special solutions. For clarity I highlight the parameters that we try to determine in the following. Well, to see if this indeed works out, we insert the trial solution into the Schrödinger equation. That means that we first work out the two sides separately and then equate them. The temporal derivatives are very simple because time only appears in these exponentials and according to the chain rule we then just get some additional constants multiplied to the components. And acting on the trial solution with the Hamiltonian isn't any more complicated because it is just a 2 by 2 matrix. What is notable here is that in this matrix multiplication the different exponential factors conspire so that the result still has the same time dependence in the two components as the trial solution itself. And when we then set both expressions equal to each other, as demanded by the Schrödinger equation, each component gives us a condition. And in these conditions, the exponential factors can simply be cancelled. What we have here can be interpreted as a homogeneous system of linear equations for the parameters a and b, where some coefficients also depend on capital omega. Now, if the two conditions are independent of each other, this has just one unique solution, and there a and b would have to vanish. But this is not a physical solution, and so to obtain a physical solution we have to choose capital omega so that these indeed are the same equation. Well, this is the same logic that we encounter in eigenvalue problems. And indeed, when we isolate the terms involving capital omega on one side and write the others in terms of a matrix multiplication, then this indeed takes the form of an eigenvalue problem. So capital omega enters the eigenvalue lambda, while a and b make up the eigenvector, and this is both in relation to the matrix that I here denote as a. The matrix A is real and symmetric, which is the special case of a Hamish matrix. And so the eigenvalues, and hence also capital omega, will be real, and the eigenvectors will be orthogonal to each other. And as this is a 2 by 2 matrix, we have exactly two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors, which will turn into the two special solutions that are advertised at the beginning. We find these objects in the standard way. The eigenvalues follow from the determinantal condition given here, which simply asserts that the two conditions on A and B are indeed linearly dependent, hence are really just one condition. This is a polynomial of order 2, and it remains of such a form when we translate this into a condition for capital omega. And solving for capital omega then gives us two solutions, which indeed are opposite of each other, so plus and minus of the expression given here, omega naught. This is known as the Rabi frequency. 
and we will uncover its physical interpretation very soon. But for this we will need the complete solution and hence also the eigenvectors. These can again be obtained in the standard way, where one inserts an eigenvalue into the system of equations for a and b, which then has non-trivial solutions. As the eigenvalues in our case are non-degenerate, the solutions form a one-dimensional subspace, and so it suffices to specify one of these non-trivial solutions, as all the others are just proportional to it. So we can, for instance, take these simple expressions given here. They are not normalized, but this is sufficient for our purpose. The upper and lower signs correspond to the sign of the frequency's capital omega, so the sign in front of the Rabi frequency. This completes the part of finding the two special solutions. They are just a trial solution where we insert these specific sets of values for a, b and capital omega. Now, the superposition principle still applies to the Schrödinger equation that we solved above, even with the driving, since it is still linear in the state capital Psi of the system. And according to this, the most general solution is just the sum of the two special solutions. So this can then be written as given here, where alpha and beta are constants that depend on the initial conditions. So far with the general solution. Let us then look at one specific initial condition, where the spin is initially in the state spin up. This is an eigenstate of the static part of the Hamiltonian, and so without the driving the spin would simply remain in this state. Well, including the driving we find the solution given here. This just corresponds to certain values of alpha and beta, where we initially have the state 1, 0. And what we see now is that at later times the lower component becomes finite. So we now have in general finite probabilities to be in each of the two basis states. These probabilities are just the absolute value squared of the two components and take a really simple form as given here. The process where we start in one eigenstate of the static system and end up in another eigenstate we call a transition between the two states. And the corresponding probabilities we can therefore also call transition probabilities. So this changes now over time as shown here. The probabilities display very distinct oscillations, which are indeed the eponymous Rabi oscillations that give this problem its name. The oscillation frequency is just the Rabi frequency omega naught, which then determines the oscillation period in the standard way as indicated here. The oscillation amplitude, which I denote as delta p, depends on a ratio involving also the driving amplitude v. Indeed, this takes the form of a square of a ratio of two characteristic energy scales in the driving, where we recognize a form of the Planck rule. Well, the Planck rule becomes really manifest when we ask for which conditions the transitions are realized in the most efficient way. For this, let us keep V and delta fixed and vary the driving frequency little omega. The Rabi frequency then displays a minimum when the driving frequency equals the energy spacing delta of the levels divided by h bar. And at exactly this frequency, the oscillation amplitude becomes maximal. Indeed, it becomes 1. So after half of the period, the probability to be in the second state then becomes 1 as well. Situations where a system displays a very pronounced reaction on some external driving are called resonances. And here we thus see that such a resonance occurs exactly when h bar times little omega equals the energy spacing capital delta. This really completes our discussion of this problem. Just for information, let me mention that if we would also quantize the electromagnetic field that is driving the spin, and thus end up with photons, we would simply see that the photons are periodically absorbed or emitted by the system. Of course with quantum probabilities, but under conservation of the total energy, which is just h bar omega for each of the photons.
And so the Rabi oscillations go along with the change of the energy in the driving electromagnetic field, which for systems involving a macroscopic number of spins becomes so noticeable that they can be detected even on the classical level. In this way, the Rabi oscillations become the foundation for highly accurate imaging techniques, such as electron spin resonance and nuclear magnetic resonance, which are common tools, for instance, for the characterization of materials and for medical imaging. So this is a very specific and practically important example of a driven quantum system. But in our solutions of this problem above, we also encountered some features that would be very useful if they applied in general settings. For instance, the probabilities automatically added up to 1, which means that the state remains normalized at all times. So we move on to a more general discussion where we establish properties that apply to all driven quantum systems.